Okay, we are live. Thanks for checking out Museum Ship Mafia, where we take you behind the scenes of the museum ships across the country and around the world. My name is Ken Stano with the YouTube channel History X. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let's see. And of course, it's another live crossover broadcast that we've got going on with the USS Slater and the Buffalo Naval Park on tonight's live episode. We're going to be talking about icebreakers. Uh, we've got Connor coming over from the Alexander Henry, which is a museum ship, a Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker museum ship in Thunder Bay, Ontario. So I'm excited to have him on. And I also want to make sure that everyone is aware that this episode, tonight's live episode of Museum Ship Mafia is made possible by Audible Audiobooks. Make sure you listen to the good stuff. Check out the link that I've got to Audible below in the description of this broadcast. They've got a uh, pretty good offer for you guys if you want to check them out. So let's let's see. I'm going to bring on John Epp, who is the curator of the USS Slater in Albany, New York, uh, to check out the USS Slater, their YouTube channel. Search for USS Slater. And you can also check out their website, ussslater.org. John, you all settled in? Not too bad. How are you doing? I didn't I didn't ask you how you were. I asked you if you were settled in. Remember how I said I just woke up from a nap? Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I do remember that. All right. Yeah. And uh, let's see. In addition to John, we've got uh, Shane Stevenson, curator, Buffalo and Erie County Naval and Military Park to check out the Buffalo Naval Park. Simply search for their YouTube channel, Buffalo Naval Park. You'll see all kinds of videos that pop up. And of course, you can check out their website, buffalonavalpark.org. Uh, like I always tell everyone, one of the simplest yet most effective ways to support these guys, to support these museum ships, uh, is simply check out their videos. Click like, subscribe to their channels. It's a great way to support their efforts boost their subscriber base speaking of that john where where is the slater right now when it comes to uh, subscribers oh um just over 2200 i believe 20 okay so you're continuing to grow and i know the buffalo naval park you guys are uh well over nine thousand. yeah but we have i i just uh i just did a little search today we have not grown we've been stuck within this 10 person from nine 1150 to 9160 since January 4th. We have not broken Same out here. of that. We have not broken out of that 10 person range. Oh, it really? It goes up to 160, it goes up to 9160, then back down to 1953 and then back up to nine, you know, so it so we we are kind of stuck at 19160, but uh, I do want to say I apparently cannot comment. I can't find I, I don't have uh so I can't respond to anybody. Uh, it, it, really? the scroll, yeah, it goes down, but there's no box. Like I don't see a text field for me to comment. So I want to say hello to everyone. Lego, CC, hi, how are you? Frank, I just made a couple comments on our YouTube uh, that you had responded to. Ed, how mm -hmm. are so I just want to say hi to everybody. Yeah, we've got the CC Frank. I um Eric Roper's on there. Yeah. Um Robert Evans. Yeah, he's sharing. <laughs> yeah so we and of course ed webster ed's always there hey ed, ed. you're the best that's the best yeah so i um, almost said oh someone just became a member but thank you uh who's that frank yeah hi mark yeah okay yeah. So, so yeah well and 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 like i said a few moments ago one of the best ways you guys can support uh the efforts of any museum ship that has a youtube channel simply check out their videos click like subscribe it really does help when these museum ships are able to boost their subscriber base. So that's always kind of like a, uh, I, I, I guess I, I just can't say it enough. You know, obviously you can donate, you can support these museum ships in many other ways, but to help bo uh, boost and build their social media platform, it, it, it's huge. That's the way I look at it. Uh, well, that's the way I view the next step mu all museums need to take um, in this day and age. So if you have not subscribed to the Buffalo Naval Park, if you have not subscribed to the USS Slater, please do so. Um, all right. 
Oh yeah, well, I, yeah. If you haven't subscribed to History X, <laughs> I mean, what's your problem? That you know, we we would love to have you. All right, John Up, curator, USS Slater. What's going on with you guys lately? Uh, we are starting to begin wrapping up some of our winter projects. Uh, March is pretty hectic for us and trying to get the ship cleaned and ready. Um, it does honestly look like a disaster zone in the winter, how dirty the inside of the ship gets from all of our projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in my realm, I'm working on um, a few different projects, uh, a new small new exhibit in our museum space on um, USS Stafford. So that's that's what I got going on in my world. I uh, I saw on Facebook you you keep posting about all the volunteers that keep showing up. Um, I yeah, mean, and it's yeah. every, it's everything from welding. I, it's crazy how much you got going on over well, there. Well, right we feed now. them on Mondays, so that helps. That's interesting. Just on, just on Mondays. Uh, during the season, it's usually Mondays, Tuesdays, and Saturdays as well. But in the winter time, usually just Mondays. Okay, okay. That, can I step in here, guys? Sure. Um, uh, we had, I guess. No. Okay. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> no, go for it. What are we going to ask? Uh, we actually talked about this in our staff meeting today, and we were left with the impression that the Slater volunteers pay for their own meals all the time. Is that, uh, but I'm now hearing that might not be correct? <laughs> they, okay, so. We usually have one of the staff, um, I, it's usually Joanne, our business manager, or sometimes one of the volunteers, they'll create a dish, they'll bring it in and serve it, and we have a suggested donation to help just cover the cost of the ingredients. So it's usually like two bucks. But um, Okay. Okay, because yeah. we were, you know, we had a couple of our staff go to the Slater, uh, and they said everyone puts money in a pot, and then they have one volunteer who's a cook. And he goes and buys all the food and then cooks. Oh, oh, that. So that was the work week when uh, you guys. Oh, came that's out a in work October. week. But it, when yes. You, okay, so they they. But when it's not a work week, they contribute. You you said the staff person makes a meal and or something, and mm -hmm. then that's what and yep. that's Mondays Mondays in the winter time. Yes, um, and okay, usually breakfast you. as well. We cook breakfast. I'll I'll uh, make a notation of that. I appreciate that. Hey, uh, Frank just threw in a, before we get to the Buffalo Naval Park, Frank threw up a, a question after, how do the subscriptions help the USS Slater and the Buffalo Naval Park? It, 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 it pretty much boils down to this. Any YouTube channel that reaches a thousand subscribers and 4,000 hours of watch time becomes eligible to receive advertising dollars from YouTube. And what john when did you guys you guys had a video you you had that engine startup video which was pretty damn cool that that pushed you guys over a thousand subscribers you became eligible when did that happen uh the video was september and i believe we became okay. monetized in october yeah and and i it's always been a big push for me and as i always say it's one of the simplest yet most effective ways uh you know for this reason to help these museums any museum really it doesn't have to be a naval museum it could be any museum if you're aware that they've got a youtube channel by clicking subscribe liking their videos it helps them get closer so that they can then start begin receiving advertising dollars uh from youtube and um it, it adds up after a while the more views they get yep. Yeah, the, the more dollars they receive. And uh, I know uh, the Buffalo Naval Park's receiving those advertising dollars. Uh, the U USS Slater is now. And um, eyes, eyes on the project is, is, is the way I put it. So the more eyes we get on those museums, um, mm -hmm. the better. Let's see. Well, then the Buffalo and Naval Park, their new um, membership, That's you know you got that as well. Yeah, and I'm wondering if that's what Frank. I think that's did. what he meant. Yeah, yeah. Like what? It's, well, he he did, but now all of a sudden it shows in the stream. It says new member, and his name Frank's name turned green, and so now as he's responded eight oh three eight oh four, his name is separated out of almost like because everyone else is, is a black name or handle, and then mm -hmm. his is turned green. So it says he became a new member, but what did he become a new member of? I guess is what. 
No, oh, I guess we'll find out. Uh, <laughs> I guess. Let's but, see. Uh... Uh, let's see. And uh, before we yeah, get let's... to what's going on with the Buffalo Naval Park, I just want to m- remind everybody, you know, we can't really do this. In, in any way, shape, or form, uh, without subscribers and viewers. You know, we love having you guys join us here tonight. Um, so please submit your comments, submit your questions. We'll get to them. Uh, let us know where you're from, where in the country you're from. We're going to have Connor joining us, uh, you know, from the Alexander Hendry. He's all the way up in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Uh, let us know where you're watching us from. Um, Chopper73, he always tunes in from. Australia mm-hmm. is chopper Australian. I, I always I forget. I can't, so, yeah. can't remember if it's Australian or New Zealand. Um, mm-hmm. And, and also uh, what channel you're checking us out on, you know, we're, this goes out live to three channels, USS Slater, Buffalo Naval Park and history X. Um, I, it always kind of bugs me that Buffalo Naval Park gets more views for these uh, live videos than History X does. But you know what? Just let us know where you're watching from. I always uh, find that pretty curious. So with that being said, Shane, what's the latest hmm. with Buffalo Naval Park? I would love to be like John. I'd love to be like John and say, we're beginning to wrap up winter projects, but we are not. We are on fire. Uh, you know, our... And we have a lot of projects going on now that will be ready by March 25th when we open this year. But, you know, we've brought on a lot of new energetic staff over the past uh, 12 months and they see opportunities uh, for us. And so we've been ramping up with a lot of newer ideas and things. So we're still kind of in that off-season mode and we talked again at our staff meeting about okay are we going to have everything ready by march 25th and it's yeah we will have so we're opening up a new area on the sullivans which even before the capsizing event wasn't available so we're doing that the admiral's quarters is completely getting remade uh new carpeting new furniture uh we 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 repainted we're getting uh the furniture that we have like in the uh, cruise book photos from 1972 uh, and 1974. So that's we're... going on right now. Yeah, yeah. Because I watched the uh, I watched the power up videos. That... Yeah, congratulations on oh, that. Oh yeah, that. yeah. Well, yeah. thank you and thank you to Barry, of course. Yeah, on the Sullivans. If 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 you guys aren't aware, check out the Buffalo Naval Parks YouTube channel because they've had, I think that was the third update video that you had on on getting power to the Sullivans and it, it's a long process. I get it. They're pretty informative, but I had no idea that you also had this stuff going. I knew that you were redoing the Admiral's quarters, but I didn't know. I mean, you're talking about furniture. You're talking about yeah. all this stuff. Are we going to be seeing that? Yeah. <laughs> when it's ready. <laughs> I did we, did. we did do a video on a YouTube, I don't know, maybe a month ago or so, maybe. Um, uh, and then I did a member video about, uh, for members only for us about uh, the Admiral's quarters as well. And um, yeah, what we're trying to do is make it more like a big ship, right? Like a capital ship. Like we've looked at pictures from the uh, Missouri. And when we were there, we walked through the captain's quarters and mm-hmm. uh, the, uh, so the Iowa, the New Jersey, and those are areas that they could have events in. And so yep. we said, this might be a way of, having people have a little more elegance with an event, you know, maybe we could have a dinner, you know. Oh, I'd uh, love to see you and I have already talked about this. I'd love to see you guys host wine tastings there. And uh, yes, yeah, and that so is that big. Uh, that is, that is something I brought to the table. So mm-hmm. uh, let's hope that we can continue to make that connection. But uh, for me, yeah, it's, it's uh, kind of, yeah, we're, you know, we're kind of all over the place. I, I would love to be able to sit in the collections and, just work for five hours without interruption. But, you know, in our environment, it just doesn't work that well. I I can't do that. So we Mm -hmm. have to be available for multiple things throughout the day. And I know I've been a little slacking on the YouTube videos. uh, So I'm just letting everyone know that uh, uh, I'll be getting back to that in a a few weeks. We'll start doing two to three a week again. And I'll continue with the member videos and the 20 hundred watch with Steven. Uh, for the members. Well, like and that. I wanted to bring that up because you guys had what I thought was a pretty fun um, 
exclusive if you want to say 20 hundred watch for all of your members i really enjoyed it that was <laughs> that was about two weeks ago yeah. and john was on there too uh there was about eight of us and we we were, we got to hit you guys with just about any question that we wanted and yeah. that was a good time so for yeah, those really? of you that aren't aware uh if you want to I don't know, Shane, what's the best way to describe this? Just get behind the scenes or get you guys to kind of discuss stuff that you wouldn't normally throw into the uh, the public 2000 watch? That's exactly what it is. It okay. is what we're mm -hmm. kind of marketing our 2000 watches as this is an opportunity for you to ask us any question. We don't want to drive it like, say, the Museum Ship Mafia. We, we drive the content and the conversation. In the 20 hundred watch for members only, we want the members to drive the conversation and give us ideas and we can see those ideas to fruition. Uh, so it's really user driven as opposed to uh, back end driven. So, mm -hmm. and look well, at thought, Eric. Did you, did you see Eric H's? <laughs> what? Did you see his comment? I love it. What, this <laughs> one right here? Yeah. The, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I threw that up there. Yeah, way to go, Eric. Um, I I really enjoyed it. Like I said, it was about two weeks ago. I don't know if you guys are gonna be doing that every month mm -hmm. for members. It only costs what is it, five dollars to become a member of the Buffalo Naval Park? Yeah, um, and then you get two member videos a month and one live twenty hundred watch. And so what we've decided, Stephen and I, was the twenty hundred watch will be exclusive to members now. We used to mm -hmm. we would just put them out. Uh, okay. But now this is th this museum ship mafia is going to be our live stream for everybody. The 2200 watch will be for members only. I, uh, and just, just so that you're anyone that wants to become a, a member of the Buffalo Naval Park, what Shane's talking about is if you literally go to their YouTube channel where you would normally click subscribe, there is also a join button. And if you want to join and get access to these videos, click on that button. And it's what, $4.95, $5 a month. Yeah, $4.99. Um, yeah, uh, I recommend it. And you know what? Uh, it may not be for everybody. I, I think it's a lot of fun, but if it's not for you, then then quit. It, quit after one month. I don't think you'll be doing that, though, uh, because like I yeah. said, uh, I really enjoyed it. John, what did you think about their first one? It was it was, it was was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I hope so, and, and I want, uh, you know, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. so kind of harked back to when you guys first were starting the 20 hundred watch. <laughs> a little that more. That was about a year ago, right? Yeah, we started, started yeah, yeah, we started in February. It, it would have had to have been about a year ago because remember the Sullivans took on water in April. Yes. Yep. And and so they probably were well, John, uh, what they probably did a couple of rounds of 20 hundred watch before they and took on water. It was almost every other week you guys were doing it, wasn't it? Might it wasn't just I once wanted, a month. No, I I think we, because it was so new, I think what we said was, oh, yeah, okay, let's do it every couple of weeks. And yeah. then and then the Sullivans happened. We were actually doing, as people like to remind us, we were doing a live 20 hundred watch when we saw the Sullivans starting yeah. to have a problem on April 13th. That was a Wednesday. Yeah. You know, I remember. So I remember that. You know, of course, I, I was watching. Um, John was on. You were right. That, that yeah, because yeah, you you John was no, on. I was watching. I was watching. Well, yeah, I yeah. I was watching too. Yeah. And they made that comment. I and did. what's that? I think I did. I said something's going on with the Sullivans or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then of course the next day the news broke out. Uh, those videos are still up. If you wanted to check it out, um, check out the twenty hundred watch on April thirteenth, twenty twenty two. <laughs> and Shane does mention it towards the end where the Sullivan, and then the very next day it's on CNN, MSNBC, Fox news. Everyone's talking about it. So well, uh, we get some, we, you know, we've gotten some flack over that because like, well, then why the hell were you live streaming? Why didn't you stop? And, but we had no idea of what mm -hmm. the catastrophic nature of that. And we, we were there till about one 30 in the morning because we called a couple staff people after that, because when we left the live stream, it was so much worse than when I walked in two hours prior. And so that's when we got on board for about four hours to try and, you know, assess and survey what was going on and shut doors and hatches where we could. Mm -hmm. uh, but by that time it was so. 
Yeah, okay. you're right. I don't I don't want to re reopen that can of worms um and start that all over again. The good news yeah. is the Sullivan's is 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 floating, it's solid. You guys um, you know, are making plans for a a you know, a 20, you know, summer 2023. So look forward to the positives, not back on the negatives. I think uh, you should plug your video, Ken. Which video is that? Yeah. That came out last uh last month. Thank you, man. Your 40 oh, minute uh, video. Yeah. I can yeah, I can mention that at the end as well, but uh yeah, if if for those of you that haven't checked it out, um I have a video on History X called uh, The Grave Robbers, and it's about the, the looting and the stripping of the World War II warships, battleships, battle cruisers, even some destroyers that are in the South Pacific in and around Indonesia. If you're not aware, those shipwrecks are disappearing, not like the Titanic that's kind of rusting away or anything like that. These are being strip mined, if you will, looted for their steel, for their metal. Check out History X. It's called uh, The Grave Robbers. It's about uh, a little less than 45 minutes long, and uh, it's pretty eye-opening. It seems to be something that the whole world knows about except the United States, you know, some people. But it could easily happen to U.S. shipwrecks as well. So check out yeah. uh, the Grave Robbers on History X. Thanks for uh, bringing that up, John. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was a very well done video. And the way you spliced and edited, you really spent a lot of good quality time on making that a very succinct and understandable uh, presentation to a potential complex problem. Well, I appreciate it. I yeah, appreciate it. Well Thanks. I hope, uh, I hope people continue to check it out. Um, anything else that, uh, John or Shane, you want to touch on before we, um, <laughs> agree Eric <with. laughs> couldn't agree with you. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. Um, and thanks for your support, Robert. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, Ed, I have a deer in the headlights. Look, I always do, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> uh, no, we're excited. We're redoing the tour route. We're going to try and open a little bit more of the Sullivans this year than has been in the past. So, and as I said, we're opening up the three inch 50 uh, ready service locker, which has never been opened. So we've got our caretaker, he's in there painting and cleaning and we're going to plexiglass it off and that's on the O one one level. And um, I, yeah. And I'm also doing add-ons this year. I'm sorry, guys. I, I didn't mean to uh, kind of, but in addition to the curator tour that we're doing at the Naval Park, I'm doing four add-on tours a month. And this is something we learned from the Iowa. So someone would buy a ticket, but for 30 minutes, they would get a special tour and it's an extra 10 or $15. And then in addition to them being able to just wander around the ship like normal, they would get this add-on. And then I'm, I have a gun tour that I've created, which will go to the mounts and the turrets and the barbette. Uh, and then a weapons control, which is where you and you and I were, Ken, you know, and where, where the, uh, as, uh, uh, the SPG or the SPS. Uh, oh, the damn are you talking about that, that, that freaking yeah. platform that we were on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about I, I finally was able to block that out of my memory and then and, and you bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's so the weapons control is back there on the aft superstructure, the little rock. And so we're going to be, uh, we're going to be taking people up there and it's just going to be a little add on to the ticket that they, they buy. So that's, okay. that's a whole bunch of that this year going on. So, so it sounds to me like you guys are, uh, in a, I mean, you're, you're in a mad dash to get everything ready for 2023, um, uh, season. Yeah. That's well, that's we pretty roll. exciting stuff. Thank uh, you. Don't mean to take yeah. up on more time. No, that's all right. Uh, John, anything else that you wanted to touch on before we uh, we get to our icebreaker discussion? Um, just similar to Shane. Uh, in the past, we've always had the add-on tours to the collection space or the engine room, but we never really um, shared it too much. We didn't advertise it a whole lot. Last season, we really pushed it. We, we combined everything. Full tour collections and engine room stem to stern we called it mm -hmm. we got Ooh. um i think an extra 600 people to visit the engine room and collections last year if i remember memory serves so that's really? uh, just extra money for the museum yeah so it was huge success 
Have you had any discussion at all? I mean, the the uh, the engine startup video that you guys had, I thought was fantastic. You got well over a hundred thousand views. What it could be approaching two hundred for all I know. Um, it was a great video, about fifteen minutes long. Do you think that, uh, or do you expect that could drive up the interest for people to want to check out your engine space, your engineering spaces? Um, yeah, actually, we did have people visit us saying, you know, we saw the video, which was great. We are okay. exploring um, doing little, um, I guess you could say speaker things, speaker events like quarterly. One of them is maybe bringing a select group of people down to the engine room and maybe starting our emergency generator. <laughs> um, nice. That is very preliminary. So it's a yeah. very good chance we will not do it, but it is in the discussion. Got very it. Nice. Very nice. Well, I just glanced at the clock. Um, yeah, let's, yeah, we sorry. we got it. We got, we got to get to the subject, which I'm pretty excited about. Uh, let's see. So, let me uh, let me bring this up real quick. So here's the deal. Um, we've got an opportunity to talk about icebreakers. I don't know a lot about icebreakers. Quite frankly, I consider them to be a little bit on the mysterious side for me. And I was really excited about this opportunity to learn about them. Um, the Alexander Henry is a museum ship icebreaker. Uh, it was from the Canadian Coast Guard on display in Thunder Bay, Ontario. And uh, it's... Mm, cool. it, yeah, isn't that, really isn't that a cool picture? So I got that picture. Con Connor's, con we're going to have Connor on. He's waving in the background. Yeah, Connor, I know <laughs> I haven't clicked you on yet. All right. <laughs> <Re> <laughs> give it give, give it a rest um yeah and he's he's talking and you know so we're gonna bring him on um and you know what i love the fact that connor's so excited because i have a feeling we're gonna learn a lot from this guy um and uh with without without further ado connor kilgore from the alexander henry icebreaker museum ship museum in thunder bay Ont ontario connor thank you for joining us uh thank you for having me uh no the reason why i was just smiling like that is because that is actually one of my favorite pictures of the henry mm, yeah uh, it, it yeah it's fantastic <laughs> so uh i guess should i just start with her basic history then well or just are you on board right now connor are you on board no right now? no he, no, he's I'm it. okay uh, yeah i'm at home no. Uh, because unfortunately, unlike some of you guys, our ships aren't heated, or at least my ship isn't heated. Oh. And uh, it's about 10 degrees colder inside the ship than it is outside. And it's about hovering at about zero right now or at freezing. So is that 32 for you guys? Yeah, 32. <laughs> yes. so, yeah what's under freedom I units? Freeze. And wow. uh, that's where it is for me. So I'm, I'm, I'm comfy at home. Got Here, up, and how know, much ice do you have? You want to? I'm sorry, what? How much ice? Oh, uh, I think we're seeing about two and a half to three inches of ice, uh, not inches, uh, feet of ice around the ship right now. Jeez. So you're in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, of course, I've got questions about the Alexander Henry. You're going to be giving us quite uh, a little bit of history on that. But for those of us that what what is it like to live in thunder bay ontario you are way the hell up there i'm in minneapolis which is well north but mm -hmm. i mean you're 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 way north of me what i mean do you guys have a starbucks what what is it like in thunder bay ontario <laughs> well uh we do have a starbucks uh i think we i think there are actually two in town uh one's in the mall uh but we have more tim hortons at, oh at, yeah there at we go Arcane. Uh, but because we're right on that line, we also have Robin's Donuts, which is a rival chain, which is lesser known than Tim's. Um, our winters last about five months of the year, and uh, so it's quite cold, and uh, it actually hasn't been too bad. And because of the fact that we are right on Lake Superior, uh, we are also a very active shipping port for both grain, uh, fertilizers, as well as steel as of recently. Uh, so we've been uh, becoming more and more of an active port again. So, Are you born and raised Thunder Bay? Or, or is that where you're originally from? 
my family is uh, my family is mostly from Thunder Bay. Uh, I personally was a week early, so I showed up in Hamilton. Uh, that was my birth city, but they moved back up pretty quickly after that. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'd say probably I'm 27 now, so I'd say about half of my life I've lived in this city. And before we clicked on, mm-hmm. uh, you know, maybe about 15 minutes <clears throat> before we started the live broadcast, we were talking to you a little bit. Do I remember you saying right now there's about three feet of ice around the ship? Uh, that was what I heard, yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Two and a um, half, three feet of ice. Mm. Shane, when is the last time you had three feet of ice around the uh, any of the ships? <laughs> yeah. I yeah, mean, that's, uh, that's tough. We do get ice every year, but maybe the thickness is maybe a foot or, you know, 10 inches or something like that. So mm-hmm. to hear three feet of ice, you know, causes challenges, no doubt, to, uh, yeah. to the, the ship. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, so what kind of temperatures are you seeing in Thunder Bay? Well, right now we're hovering right around freezing. So 32 for you guys. Um, and, uh, but we would, last week we saw minus 40 temperatures at night and it minus 40 is the same for both Fahrenheit and Celsius. So that's easy mm-hmm. to calculate. Uh, yeah. But our winters generally average about minus 20 to minus 25. Uh, up for about two months from January till the end of February. Then it starts warming up again. What about okay. summers? What are summers like in Thunder Bay? Um, probably no hotter than 32 Celsius. So translate that to Fahrenheit for the American viewers. Or... It doesn't get it doesn't get too too hot. Uh, yeah, that's. I mean, well, wait, isn't the for, isn't the formula you add 32 and then four or something or yeah. you know, it was something like it. You double it and then add four. Yeah. So 32 plus 32 is 64 plus four. It'd be about 70 be. degrees. It's 89. It's what? Yeah, I was going to say. Um, 89. 89, 89 Fahrenheit. I used to live in Toronto and uh, mm-hmm. let's see. So it was like I you know. doubled it and then you added 32. Oh, so you, you doubled added 32. It. Yeah, that's what it was. So you doubled okay, it in this particular sorry. case, 32, 64. Then you add 32. So that takes it up. So, you know, you're, you can get to the mid 90s. All right. Yeah. So yeah, and, uh, I love it. Eric H. Yeah, he answered it as well. 89.6. Oh, thanks, Great. Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Eric to the rescue. Um, yeah. yeah. I and, always uh, say math was not my strong point. So thank you for not <laughs> listening to me. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Santa Claus, pretty cool guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean he's pretty cool. Yeah. All right, all right. Tell us about the hockey team up there in Thunder Bay. Which one? <laughs> well, that's what I'm asking. Do you, would you yeah. guys have a OHL? Is it? Yeah, it'd be OHL. Yeah, we have NHL up here, um, but uh, that's not main. That's not the main reason of this interview. But go Leafs. <laughs> I'm a Leafs guy personally, and it's partially because Did my grandfather was a fan. Leafs fan. So okay. Being a Sabres fan, obviously, I, I, okay. but Connor, you're a good guy. I like that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So the Alexander Henry, um, yes. icebreaker, co- uh, Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker, yeah. and uh, it's a museum ship that you guys have on display there to <laughs> uh, to learn more about what Connor's got going on there. Their website, which I thought was pretty impressive, www.tmtb.ca. Tm. Yes tb.ca tmtb what does that stand for transportation museum of thunder bay uh you see up until this year uh we were the lakehead transportation museum society however we have decided to rebrand uh the museum itself to be the transportation museum of thunder bay because we feel it reflects our role within our within our community because while we are we our main feature is the alexander henry our goal is to be the transportation hub for this region because our city has built many things we've built ships we've built planes we've built buses we've built trains and on and on and on Mm -hmm. uh if we i know you guys are all world war ii guys well my city built hurricanes and hell divers during the second world war really Yes. You built, you built hurricanes up there? Yes, we did. No uh, kidding. Yeah, we wow. built hurricanes and we also built hell divers because the British were considering 
uh, using them on their carriers. Mm -hmm. They decided not to use them, and the Americans bought up the contract. Okay. So <laughs> we continued building hell divers. So we very cool. And we've also built buses and trains and everything else and ships, which is what the Henry is. Mm -hmm. And how did you how did you become involved with the Alexander Henry? So I became involved with the Henry. With the Henry, actually, I can give you the exact date was uh, July first, twenty twenty. So two years ago, almost three years ago. And uh, basically, in, in Canada, we had very strict restrictions during the height of COVID, and I was bored out of my skull. Uh, the Henry opened uh, for exterior to tours only, and I decided to go aboard. I absolutely loved it. And by the next month, I was a volunteer. And now this is where I am now. Uh, all right. That's pretty cool. So you're basically telling me that uh, you were bored during the pandemic. You went for a tour and then it sucked you in. Yes, basically. I was already a history buff before then. And I was following the whole story of the Texas uh, before then, but I wasn't really into museum ships until mm -hmm. I got more of the Henry. And okay. just as a side note, um, because of my interest in the Henry, I ended up joining the museum ships Facebook page, where I then ended up becoming an admin there probably about two months later. Oh, no Ooh. kidding. Okay. Yeah, so I'm also with the museum <laughs> ships Facebook page. So and are you, Connor, are you a volunteer there or are you... How does that work? What are the paid staff? What's the organization? So like? currently we have no regular paid staff. Okay. Uh, we have no regular paid staff. Uh, we're all volunteers. We're an all volunteer organization. Uh, I'm not a board member yet, but I am one of the most senior non board members at this point. And I'm trusted to do things like this. Good for you. You know, I, I'm sorry. I got to interrupt you. I, I yeah. love this story already. And the reason I love this story, and of course, yes, we're going to get to the ship. Mm -hmm. But I love the fact that you just showed up. And, and this is a test. Th this, this should be a lesson to a lot of people. Uh, you just showed up. You went for a tour. You you loved what you saw. You probably got a very, very good impression by the other volunteers that were there. And mm -hmm. you decided to try and find out how you could help. Yeah, that, that's basically it. And I didn't even get a full tour because we weren't allowed inside the ship under COVID regulations at that time. So I just mm -hmm. walked to the decks. Like I was just given an exterior tour. Wow. Yeah. And so that, that was just how impressive it was for me. And, and the reason I love that so much is that anyone that has any kind of a museum ship in their area, local, um, that they check out, it could, and, and they want to do more if they have time or they want to volunteer, it could be as easy as that is just showing up for a tour. And what did you do? You started talking to people and say, Hey, how can I help? Yeah, basically, um, basically about halfway through the tour, I, the, my tour guide that day, who was named Charlie, uh, basically talked, was pointing out things that still had to be done. And I basically said, I can do that. And I inquired, how would I go about becoming a volunteer? And eventually it led me joining. Well, I think that's a great story. I love hearing mm -hmm. stuff like that. And, uh, you know, of course, Shane's always talking about, um, you know, increasing the volunteer base at the uh, Buffalo Naval Park. The USS Slater has an incredibly strong volunteer base. And anyone that wants to help out with a museum ship, these are operations that would love to get that kind of support. So I think that's a great story. Thanks for sharing that with us. A great story. Um, so, all right, the Alexander Henry. Uh, yeah. You sent me a whole bunch of pictures, which I thought were fantastic. And I've got them here, you know, ready to show people tonight. Yeah. What what do you want us to know about the Alexander Henry and, and icebreakers in general? Um, well, so I'll let you take it away. Go ahead. Okay. Well, in order to understand why the Henry came to be built, you got to talk about the lakes themselves. Uh, the Great Lakes do freeze over most years to some degree. Uh, this year is not as much, but uh, well, Lake Superior is now really starting to freeze over. But uh, in general, it's not as much. But there, there is need for icebreakers, especially right near the end of the shipping season and right near the beginning of the shipping season. Um, well, in the United States, uh, with your significantly larger budget for these things, uh, you had quite a few icebreakers on the lakes. Uh, most notably, I believe someone mentioned it in the comments, there was the icebreaker Mackinac which was a massive, yeah, there it is right there, uh, the Mackinac. 
And uh, but Canada did not have as many. Uh, and there was a push in the early 1950s to have an icebreaker built for the upper lakes, which are Lake Huron, Lake Superior uh, for the Canadian side. Well, this would uh, this would result in about 1950, 53 or 54, depending on which article I've read, uh, essentially the order for a new icebreaker to be built on the great for the Great Lakes. It was designed by a Canadian company named German and Milne, uh, which were architects, uh, naval architects, and they designed a 210 foot uh, icebreaker uh, to clear the ice and deploy buoys and also as a third rule also act as a uh, lighthouse tender so she's actually three roles in one she's got the whole of an icebreaker uh she's got the utilities of a buoy tender but she's also got more storerooms for uh bringing foodstuffs to various uh, lighthouses around the great lakes <laughs> and uh, okay, so wait, let me, let me let me interrupt you real quick. So that that kind of gives us an idea of the demand, why it needed to be built. Mm -hmm. What what goes in? What makes an icebreaker different than how how not only does how how an icebreaker works, but yeah, I mean physically, what makes it different from an average ship? Well, thicker hull for a start. Uh, Henry sure. is classified as a light icebreaker under the old system because she had a single reinforced hull. Um, to give you an idea, her bow is 11 inches thick. Uh, her side- 11 inches. Yes, 11 inches. <laughs> her sides are three and her stern is one inch. So considerable amount of steel. And that's why despite being only 210 feet, she weighs, how much was it again? I had it written down here. Uh, she weighs 2,537 tons despite being only 210 feet long. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it also comes down to power. Uh, she had two Fairbanks Morris, 10, well, she has, I should say, they're still there, uh, two 10-cylinder Fairbanks Morris diesel engines, mm -hmm. and they allowed the ship to punch through, a, what was the number? Basically, she could go at about two knots through most of the ice she experienced on the Great Lakes, uh, which was slow, but it was steady. Uh, that's a good picture right there. That's when we brought her to where she is right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, you know, there, uh, there wasn't necessarily an order that I saw yeah, to the awesome. files. If, so, if anyone has any questions about pictures as they come up, feel free to ask. I actually the, have a um, question. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, John. So the first one we saw with the launching. Yeah. Um, so she was built in Thunder Bay, correct? Yes. Uh, so uh, what ended up happening was... Uh, the contract was given to Collingwood Shipyards, who then subcontracted the work to the Port Arthur Shipbuilding Company. Now, the city of Thunder Bay was originally two cities, the city of Port Arthur and Fort William, and they amalgamated in 1970. Uh, so the Port Arthur Shipbuilding Company is on the north side of Thunder Bay, and they were contracted to build the Alexander Henry after they had just finished up a series of minesweepers for the Royal Canadian Navy. Uh, so she was the right. She was the very next ship after that, and uh, she was laid down on the twenty fifth of nineteen fifty seven. Uh, she entered service, not entered service, but she launched on the eighteenth of uh, July nineteen fifty eight, and that's the picture you see here. Mm -hmm. and that was sixty five years ago. Yeah, so it'll be sixty five years ago, and then um, she entered service on July thirtieth. 1959 so there's a lot of julys it's all in july so she took two years to build where is she in relation to where this photo was taken right now uh she's probably about 10 minutes down the waterfront in terms of driving well, that's pretty cool it does yeah. is there any remnants of uh the shipyard it's still running the, uh... oh really oh, okay oh, the okay. shipyard is now called heddle marine and uh because uh the shipbuilding company uh, the Port Arthur Shipbuilding Company went under in 94, uh, but now it's owned by Hell Marine, and they do ship maintenance as well as component manufacturing there. And they're currently looking for a contract from I've heard to build something. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So if I could pipe in too, Connor, uh, thanks for being here again. I appreciate it. Uh, so what do we – do you know what the shipyard was building? That seems like a long time from keel laying to – uh, to commissioning, I guess. How long ago was it? 
two years. Two years. Yeah, that's that's quite a bit of time. Like, was were they doing other? Were they doing marine? Were they doing lake freighters? Like, what else oh, were they building? If you because I actually have it right here. I have literally the list of all the ships they built uh, <laughs> because I'm that type of guy. And <laughs> let's see. I'll there. throw one at you, Shane. Um, going to the Slater. Slater was built at Tampa Shipbuilding. DEs are supposed to take anywhere from a month to like three months to build. Every single DE built by Tampa Bay Shipbuilding took an average of seven to 13 months. Oh my God. Slater took 11 months. So I'm trying to okay, figure so, that out. Yeah. So to answer your question, uh, during the time the Henry was being built, they built two dredges, two barges in that time. So yeah, they were working on other projects along with the Henry. Okay. Hmm. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Now, when, when something like the, uh, so you talked about the thickness of the hull, you talked mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, the, the, the thickness of the bow, the sides, the stern, but when you when you think about like you said right now the ice is three feet thick around this thing okay yeah so well, normally, yeah. were there operating parameters where it was effective and then you know certain conditions where it wasn't yeah basically and that's why she is classified as a light um we wouldn't take her like right into the heart of the arctic circle for example uh, mm -hmm. she doesn't have the power for that uh and what also is a thing on the great lakes is the Great Lakes, as far as shipping goes, for the most part, it shuts down for two months uh, from probably the early first couple weeks of uh, January right till the later half of March. So icebreakers aren't needed in that time. So the thickest ice, the icebreakers, with a few exceptions, never really have to touch it. They just have to wait. So they just sit in their ports and they wait. And then okay. when, when the shipping season starts again, the icebreakers go out. Can you go back, Ken? Can you go back to that uh, the launching photo? Yeah. Sure, please. Yeah, You're I'm very about curious it. about this. Take a look at the flag by the crane in the background. That is a full Union Jack. Am I seeing yes, that right? Yeah. Do you uh, know the yes, history of that? It's not like the flag of Ontario. Well, Canada, Canada was a member of the well, is still a member of the Commonwealth, which is a collection of former British colonies. And it should also be pointed out that Canada was a dominion at that time, or at least okay. a functioning dominion. So we were an independent country, but, and we still, it's still this way today. The queen is still technically, or sorry, the king is mm. now the state. Uh, yes, I'm, we're still getting used to that over here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, thank you. So yeah, that's, yeah, I just so am surprised there wasn't a provincial flag up there, you know, uh, or something. But I get there it. would probably be a provincial flag somewhere here. I've seen this picture <laughs> from another angle, and uh, there is a Canadian uh, Canadian flag of that period and a provincial flag as well. Thank you. Uh, you, you can only see the British one from here, though. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. All That's right. Cool. So I I interrupted you with a bunch of uh, questions. Yeah. Um, where Where do you want to head next? Well, uh, after she was commissioned, uh, she was commissioned on the 30th of July. Uh, she would serve until 1985, mostly on the Great Lakes. Uh, initially, she did have some uh, problems with her design. Uh, she suffered from vibrations, uh, and this was partially due to her propellers, which were four-bladed props. But this was mostly fixed by actually switching to six-bladed props. And I don't understand the engineering behind it myself, but apparently that did change a lot of the dynamics, I guess. That's a beautiful picture right there. Mm -hmm. um, and she also had a problem with her engines. Uh, she, well, her max speed was 13.5 knots. And at initially, for at least, at least the first decade, she occasionally would have trouble with engine fires or with stack fires. And they weren't, apparently, depending on who you asked, it was either a design problem or over-oiling, uh, depending on who you asked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but they did eventually fix that problem, although it did actually lead to the Henry to have a less than uh, nice nickname within the Coast Guard, uh, the Burning Trash Can. <laughs> yeah, oh, but, but that's such a term of endearment. Yeah, 
But despite that, Henry did her duty uh, for 20 years and more. She, every single year, all year round, she would go out to these lighthouses, resupply them, because back in those days, the lighthouses weren't automated. Uh, so you would have to go every two weeks and resupply the lighthouses and the workers and their families that lived out there. Uh, in this city, where, like in Thunder Bay, she's famous for the fact that for us, she's the sign that spring is coming. Because for the people who lived in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s, when they saw the Henry enter the harbor, they knew, okay, we're less than six weeks away from <laughs> spring. It's coming. So for a lot of people, the Henry was just a sign of, yes, we're almost through this. And that was actually one of the main motivating forces for a lot of our older volunteers to actually try and bring the Henry here back in 2017. Well, and I, I want to hear about the effort to to get it there. But, you know, first of all, I, I dug into some of the pictures that you sent. Mm. I mean, oh, they're, yeah. they're, they're pretty impressive. Um, mm. You know, and I, I really like this one because obviously, you know, it's iced over. But then in the foreground, you've got some guy speeding past on a uh, um, an ice racer. Yep. So, uh, you know, it's. It just kind of shows what life was like, you know, up there. And I, I think this is a great picture. You yeah. know, going and uh, to... those ice racers are still buzzing around in the harbor. Oh, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we get them a lot here in Minneapolis, um, mm -hmm. Lake Harriet. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, so I, I see them a lot. But but for a lot of other people, they're probably pro – they probably don't even know what that is. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, oh, I love uh, that one heck of a crane, like just the comments. Um, Just reading through the comments here. Yeah, it's she's a she's a good looking chip. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. What's the compliment? It's the uh, crew pump. Oh, thank you. I was sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. There We're sharing a brain cell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, what is the crew like? Uh, so the crew complement of the Henry was thirty three, uh, with four officers, four engineers, hmm. uh, four cooking staffs, and the rest were bosons and deckhands. Uh, and from what I understood, the, the crew generally was on about a year, year and a half at a time. Some guys were only in there for like a summer or for a season. Then they would leave. You guys would come on. Uh, but I think uh, in total, over the course of her 25 years, Henry had six captains. So that kind of gives you a rough estimate for officer turnover. What do you know about you know what are, do you have any knowledge or any any kind of exposure as to what it was like to to actually I, i'll use the term serve mm -hmm. on the icebreaker you know what, what uh, the conditions were like for the crew uh conditions on board were actually cold <laughs> uh, at least during the winter months uh but from what i've been told uh because i have talked with a few members of the crew uh generally the life on board if you weren't an engineer uh, was relatively comfortable. Uh, unlike some of our American counterparts who slept in bunks, like bunk rooms with tons of guys in a single room, Henry was actually divided up so that it was two guys in a single room and it was 12 hour shifts. So they never saw each other. Uh, so you, so it was actually relatively quite cozy on the ship, comparatively speaking. And, uh, in, internally, I don't think I sent you any internal shots and I wish I had done that, but, a lot of the inside of the ship is actually wood. Uh, so it has a really nice look on the inside, especially on the three upper decks. I I checked out, you know, I, I, I looked up as many uh, videos of the Alexander Henry that I could find on YouTube, obviously posted by people that were, that were mm -hmm. touring the ship. And I came across something, a common theme that I, that I really didn't expect, not necessarily when it came to the subject of the videos themselves, but the people that commented mm -hmm. on the videos. And the common theme was, well, I had an uncle that served on the Henry or, you know, and it sounded to me, the common theme was that it was, it was rough. Uh, some people didn't get along with other people. And you had mentioned a few moments ago that they would only last maybe about a year or so, and then they 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 were gone or they quit. Um, is that is that is that accurate? Uh, I wouldn't know honestly. Uh, 
just generally from what I've heard, uh, most of the Coast Guard guys I've talked with sure. that served on the Henry enjoyed their time. And they might have okay. had problems with certain individuals, perhaps, but they thought the ship itself was just fine. Well, um, when I when I see a picture like okay. this, it, yeah. it, it, it I think it it takes a lot of. What am I trying to say? Uh, a certain kind of guy. Yeah. No, it to, definitely to, does. It definitely does because when you work, especially in these environments where it's minus thirty, it, it it does take a certain type of person to tolerate this because you're not moving quick. Uh, there's a constant sound of ice scraping on your hull. It's cold. Um, yeah, it, it took. It takes a lot, and it still does. Like our modern ships are infinitely better than what Henry was, but it it was still it was still a challenge. And I would not be surprised if people joined the Coast Guard or joined the ship out of just you know, oh, I'll do this for a season, make some money, and then they just didn't like it because it was very different to what they had probably been used to. Yeah. And you talk about a ship that's 200 feet long. Well, that sounds like a lot, mm. but I could imagine, you know, when you're in a situation like this, like you said, moving slowly, that 200 feet can get pretty small. Yeah. And you also got to look at the ship. About half of it is just cargo holds and hull. Mm. Uh, yeah. The, the whole, like the, there's nothing in the front. There's like the bosun's locker and there's like two cargo holds. That's it. Like, so there's no living space uh, in front of the superstructure. I don't know if you've actually ever, you know, checked out Museum Ship Mafia before, mm -hmm. but one of the things that we talk about a lot when it comes to the USS, the Sullivans, the uh, Fletcher class destroyer at the Buffalo Naval Park, yeah. we constantly or we frequently talk about dry docking. Yes. To to make repairs. And you sent a couple of pictures that I thought mm. were pretty cool. <laughs> so, so this was her latest dry docking. Um, before I get to this, I just want to explain when the Coast Guard retired Henry in 85, they retired her because a new ship had come online called the Samuel Risley, uh, which is still in service today and is doing the Henry's job. Uh, so we actually today, like people of my generation, have the same association with the Risley that I had that my parents had with the Henry. Um, but when they retired her, the decision was made to actually donate her to a museum in Kingston, Ontario, which is right at the mouth of the St. Lawrence Seaway. And she went there. And one of the beautiful things about Kingston was they had a dry dock as part of their museum. And that's what you're looking at here. Oh, no hmm. kidding. Yeah. I and mean, uh, not only is it part of the museum, but it actually works. Yes. Uh, this is her 2010 dry docking. Uh, it was actually part of a process. They were actually rebuilding the dry dock at the same time. Uh, wow. But they used the opportunity to actually uh, do some work on the hull. So we're 12 years since our last dry docking. And uh, we're hoping at some point to get her into dry dock again the, later down the line. But uh, we're not in urgent need of it just yet. So you are – so the – this might be a two-part question. I'll give right. you. Uh, the I'll give one in a second, but so when you do dry docking like this, is it still owned by uh, the government? Are they the ones paying for dry docking or? No, no. Uh, yeah. we are, we, we do not get any regular support from the Canadian federal or provincial governments. Uh, we do get grant, like we do apply for grants, some of which we get, uh, but we get no regular support in that way. Um, the Canadian Coast Guard does appreciate the work we do, and they have posted about us a number of times, but we don't get any regular financial support from, there, from them either. But we we are talking with a couple of groups to potentially repaint the entire hull this upcoming year and a few other things as well. So there is stuff in the works, but to answer your first question, though, no, we don't get anything regular. Thank you. Uh, second question, who was Alexander Henry? <laughs> okay, so uh, most Canadian this, Coast Guard story, ships... This story is pretty interesting, too. So, yeah, go ahead, Connor. So most Canadian Coast Guard ships are named after people of either historic or cultural significance. 
There are a few exceptions, like, for example, CCGS Griffin, which is named after the first European ship to really explore the Great Lakes. Uh, oh, yeah. So there's a few exceptions. Uh, but Henry herself, herself was named after an explorer named Alexander Henry. And there were two of them. Uh, she's the first ship I recall seeing to Oh, that's cool. I see, I see, um, I was, yeah, that's an interesting thing too, Eric. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah I, I can't tell you why we, we have that, but we do. Um, could that be meters and feet? It could very well be. Or I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, meters and feet maybe. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry Imperial to interrupt. and metric or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So there's actually two Alexander Henrys. There's Alexander Henry the Elder. Uh, which some uh, websites incorrectly credit as being the person who is named after. But it's actually named after his nephew, Alexander Henry the Younger, who went on a number of expeditions throughout Canada and the United States, uh, fur trading, exploring. Uh, but one thing he was really famous for was he was actually a very detailed diarist or a journal guy. He wrote his journal. And at the time, in the 1950s, his journals were kind of being rediscovered. And he had extremely, extremely detailed descriptions of life in that era. Uh, and that was part of one of the reasons why he was chosen. And what era are we talking about? I'm sorry. Uh, the, name, the name of the namesake of the ship, Alexander. No, no, no. Uh, uh, what era was he in? Oh, it was the 1800s. Uh, sorry. 1800s? Yeah, so he was he was primarily his journals start like right in the 1790s and uh, he, oh, unfortunately okay. passed, he unfortunately passed away in 1814 uh, around what is near Astoria, Oregon today. Ooh. I think it's Oregon. But yeah, uh, that's where he passed away, unfortunately. Home of kindergarten cop, yes. Yes. Anyway, uh, yeah, he was right near that. It was involved with the whole War of 1812 and stuff. Yeah. I just thought it was pretty. I, I I thought it was pretty interesting how um, this ship was named after a a fur trader, mm -hmm. and I I've never heard of anything like that. That's probably the only instance I've ever heard of that happening, and I I just found that fascinating. It is a pretty unique, uh, pretty unique namesake, and it actually kind of fits my region because. My city is host to Old Fort William Historical Park, which is one of the largest recreations of a fur train post mm, in North America. Cool. So I think it is kind of fitting in that respect because he did cool, actually okay. visit the original fort. That is really cool. So when you, uh, when the Alexander Henry, Henry mm -hmm. goes into dry dock, and I know you said it's been about 10 years. Yeah. When a Fletcher class destroyer like the USS the Sullivans or a destroyer escort like the Slater, you know, one of the things it goes into dry dock, one of the things they, they have to talk about or have to worry about is you, you've got an, ex, an incredibly thin hull, mm -hmm. three eighths of an inch thick. Mm -hmm. And and I apologize to those that don't want to get into the engineering details, but tough. Um I, I can't imagine you guys have the same concerns that a destroyer or destroyer escort has with a thin hull. You've got an incredibly thick hull. Yeah. So you're not talking, you're, you're not worrying about cracks. You're not worrying about uh, degradation of the steel per se, are you? Well, no, and we're extremely fortunate because Henry in total only spent three months in salt water in her entire existence. Around Newfoundland, uh, right? Yeah, and uh, she went to Newfoundland uh, from August to October of forty, no, of eighty-four. And uh, basically, what happened was one of her half sisters, as we call them, because there were a ton of Coast Guard ships that were similar but not the same. Uh, one of her half sisters, Humphrey Gilbert, uh, was put into dry dock, and she was in dry dock longer than expected. So they pulled the Henry out of the Great Lakes to take her place for a few. Uh, for a few months. So that was the only time she ever touched salt water. So we have very little corrosion, if any, really. Nice. In that regard. Uh, I mean, fresh water will still corrode, but comparison to a salt water vessel. What, uh, do you have any, um, any kind of water coming in at all? To my to knowledge, like no. Uh, oh. To my knowledge, no. 
Wow. That's and I go incredible. aboard every day. So yeah. uh, that's so amazing, right? Like looking at this ship mm -hmm. and that the fact that she is shorter mm -hmm. in length than our croaker mm -hmm. is astounding to me. Our, our submarine. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was on silver side I was and, on silver you know, side this year and I thought the same thing. Yeah. And as you said, the weight was 2,500 tons. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was roughly that. Yeah. It was 20, yeah, 2,537 tons. So what's it like to be a volunteer for for something like the uh, the Henry, uh, you know, an icebreaker? Uh, you know, when you when you when it comes to people coming on board, do you, do you uh, are they guided tours? Do you allow people to just um, uh, ro roam around, uh, you know, self guided like uh, the Buffalo Naval Park? How do you guys operate that? So uh, just before I answer that, I just want to say that after I'm done, I would like to tell you how we brought it to Thunder Bay. Oh, like we'll I get to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but to answer, oh, help me. What was your question? Oh no! What was your oh, question? Oh yeah. Here? Well, I I was just you know what maybe we should uh, before oh, no, I, I, I volunteer. I remember now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, so what it's like to be a volunteer? I think it's awesome. Uh, my function on the ship when we're open is as a tour guide. Uh, because we've been operating for the last two two seasons in sort of a slower COVID mind mindful way, we've just done guided tours. So the ship, so we, we essentially, we, we schedule tours at certain times, enough people show up, everyone goes on, do the tour. And um, we're, we're thinking. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, did he just lock for up? For the, oh, there looking at the guided tour my, uh, system. Do me and a favor, are, repeat, what you, repeat what you just said, because you locked up for a few moments. Okay. Um, yeah. So... To answer your question, um, we have been operating in a sort of a COVID mindful way. So we've been in guided tours only. Uh, but now that we're hopefully uh, with COVID in the taillights, uh, we're hoping that we might change it up. But we're still just looking at that. So I can't really say anything for certain yet. But right now we are a guided tour situation. And okay, so let then you you talked about or you briefly touched on you know so when the Henry um, was replaced, mm -hmm. and it what I had read was that there were there were three options. Mm -hmm. um, she could be scrapped, uh, and there was a tremendous cost with scrapping mm -hmm. the Alexander Henry. I was I was surprised, it was like four hundred thousand dollars. And, um, uh, but there were two other, two other options, one of which was, um, to be handed over. It was Kingston, right? Yeah. So this is, so what you're referring to is when Kingston lost the ship, uh, ah. in 2016. And yes, they had three options for disposal. They could, uh, they could scrap the ship, uh, sink the ship as a diving attraction in Lake That's Ontario right. yeah. mm -hmm. or, uh, donate it to another museum. And that's where we come into the picture. All right. So, yeah, so, so what what was involved in in getting getting the the Henry over to where it is now? Okay. So um, the Kingston Museum had her from the later half of '85 until 2016. Unfortunately, uh, that museum was forced to move from their location because they had they had been renting their property from the Canadian government for one dollar a year. It's part of a heritage initiative. Uh, sadly, uh, in 2016, the Canadian government decided to sell the property to a condo developer. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Henry got kicked off their property, and they had to moor it to an island. There's actually a picture of it moored to the island if you look through. Uh, it, hold on a the trees in the background. Oh Keep wait, in the tree. The trees in the, the background. Trees in the background. Hold on a second. I think I know which picture you're talking about. You're yeah. talking about Shane. What are you doing? What do you mean? There. I'm muting his mic. I don't know what <laughs> what he was doing. Um, let's see. I he know what sounded like a teacher. I yeah. don't know what he was doing. Um, who? I just sounded like a teacher. Yeah, yelling at his uh, students. Yeah. No, no, there there we, this, yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm, okay. So, I'm, okay. 
Shane's behaving yeah. now, so he's got his mic back. So, so, um, um, so what happened was they were forced to move from their location, and they moored the Henry next to an island uh, near Kingston, and the owner of this property owned a scrapyard, from what I understand. And he gave them one year to find a new home for the ship. Give him one year. And he said, if you don't, I'll take it, essentially. I'll take it and I'll scrap it. Wow. So they had three choices. Scrapping, sinking as a diving attraction, or uh, giving it to us. Um, we had just formed that year uh, in 2016. And our mission was to preserve the transportation history of the region. Uh, we are the Lakehead Transportation Museum Society. And we heard that the Henry was at risk of being scrapped and many of our older members decided that we should try and bring the Henry home. And over the next year, we raised money to bring the ship home. And uh, the city of Thunder Bay chipped in $100,000 and the city of Kingston surprisingly came in with $50,000 because even they did not want to see the ship scrapped. Mm -hmm. So we purchased the ship from the city of King from the Kingston Museum for two dollars, one dollar to us and one dollar to the lawyers. <laughs> and uh, then we had the ship towed from Kingston to Thunder Bay. It cost roughly two hundred and forty thousand dollars to make the move and it took us 10 days. And she arrived back in our harbor on the 27th of June. 2017 the deadline that that scrapper had given them was june 30th mm -hmm. so we beat them by 13 days mm -hmm. that was just how close to the wire we were getting when we brought her home wow. um initially we initially we we moored her to the old uh, iron ore dock until we negotiated with the city and then in November of 2017, she was docked where she is now at the old Pool 6 site, uh, which is now actually our new cruise ship dock, a uh, cruise ship dock directly behind us. So is that the way the no, Henry that, appears now? No, that's Kingston. Oh. Oh. Yeah, because you see the, see, the, see the dry dock she's in? That's the dry oh, dock. Oh, yeah. it's in yeah. the dry dock in yeah. that picture. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, that's a beautiful location. It is. Seriously, they had 100% the best place a museum should could ask for. <laughs> yeah. And I will say, though, in a good in a good turn of events, the company that the Canadian government sold it to, uh, that property to, determined it wasn't suitable for condo development. <laughs> a third party bought the property. And then donated it back to that museum. So that museum is nice. now back in its original home again. Just Do without they want the ship. ship back. <laughs> uh, no, they can keep the model. They they have the model. <laughs> okay. Nice. Uh, I yeah, there was a picture of the model. So yeah. this so is there she is. Okay. This is how it's set up now. Yes. Um, Got it. Yeah, so this is how we set up now. Uh, currently we don't have a proper building, we just have a gift shop, which is pictured. Uh, you can see there that little uh, building. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a few other things on the property. Uh, we have, which I unfortunately didn't send you pictures of, but we do have other boats and train related artifacts on the grounds, uh, which because we are a transportation museum and normally people buy their tickets, meet their tour guide, right? The gangway there and then just walk on and it's about a 45 minute tour. Frank, Frank had a question here I wanted to yeah. bring up because I'm curious too. Um, does the Alexander Henry still or can it run? Um, everything is still there. Unfortunately, the ship hasn't run in, oh, since 85. So however many years it's been, 47 years roughly. So mm -hmm. it would need a lot of work. And at this time, we really don't, we really can't afford to get running again. It, like So it's not, as it stands right now, no, but it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. One of um, one of the biggest challenges, you know, when when the Buffalo Naval Park is hit with that question, one of the biggest challenges is that you know these ships are available mm -hmm. essentially after they've been. What do you want to call it, Shane? Like scavenged for parts, you know? Yeah, cannibal is it cannibalized by the Navy? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people will ask the question. It's like, well, how, you know, can the Sullivans run? Can the USS Little Rock 
run. Well, no, because if there were, if there's an engine block there, that might be it. All these other parts were, you know, they, and, and they don't make them anymore. So basically what you're saying is the Henry is intact. Yes. But you know, you'd obviously have to, how many engines does it work that needs to be done? Um, it was actually quite remarkable because when the Coast Guard retired her, they actually sailed her to the dry dock that she was in at Kingston. Hmm. Yeah, so okay. she had a she had an epic in May Perfect. of eighty in May of eighty five. They left Thunder Bay for what they thought would be the last time. They took a ten day trip. They visited her base at Perry Sound. They stopped in Windsor, Ontario, and they worked their way to uh, Kingston, where they literally sailed her into the dock. And our very last a record of the day is the day they handed over the keys, essentially, which was uh, the twenty seventh of May. So hmm. yeah, it, it's quite an incredible story. I do think they did some minor welding to like cut a hole in a stack or something to know technically disable, but uh, yeah, I, I can't say for sure, but everything's still there. Her props are still on her engine's still there. Uh, mm -hmm. So she's relatively in good shape. How many shafts Connor? Two shafts. Two shafts. One rudder yeah. or two rudder? Probably one rudder. speed one. Rudder. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, does the Alexander Henry have any secrets? In what way? Um, not not anything drastic. Like there was no murders or no deaths on board. No, no, not, nothing like that per se. Like, are there are there any? Are there any, like? I always like to find out if there's any particular place on the ship that you know that's your favorite. That maybe oh. not part of the tour. You know, anything like that at all. Well, my favorite place on the ship that isn't part of the tour, if we're going to go by that, um, is the engine room. Uh, it's a very cool space. Uh, we're, we're possibly going to open it up for limited tours next year, special guests, things like that. Uh, we haven't opened it up regularly yet, uh, but we are definitely considering now, because I know before I got on, you were talking about doing special tours of certain parts of the ship that weren't just part of the normal tour. We're, we're considering doing something like that too, like a hard hat type tour. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. And other than that though, my favorite place on the ship has got to be the wheelhouse because you're, you're five stories in the air and it's just a beautiful, like you can't really see it, but there's a beautiful <laughs> view of the city from the wheelhouse. Cause we're actually facing the city from this angle this position are th is there an open bridge there too counter like on the sides of those like bridge wings or yes. is that just like the, yeah. the is that the overhead of the no, it's, it's open bridge wings there's okay. actually a picture of a model yeah there that oh. like if i go here mm -hmm. eh, it doesn't really but i mean you can kind of see like to the side of the wheelhouse on either side port and starboard you can kind of yeah. see yeah bridge wings yeah, so there i don't is know yeah, so there is uh, two open, like two open wings. Uh huh. Oh, look at the helo on the back. You don't have the yeah. helo, do you? Though? No, we don't. I thought, it, mm, I thought I read online they did not equip the ship with that. Uh, we could we could operate a helicopter. We just had no facilities to like store one. So we didn't have a hangar. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so a helicopter could land, and it's funny you brought that up. Uh, Henry's first blueprint, uh, where she was just known as pro hold on, what's the number again? She was originally just known as Project Eight Six Five. Uh, that that original design did not have a helicopter deck. That was added in about two years between. Ken doesn't like open bridges. And, uh, yeah. that, that was open. That was that was added. The helicopter deck was added between her first blueprint and her finalized design. And I will say though that the the wheelhouse does actually close, so you the everything's functional. You can be inside. We're not like British cruisers where everything is open and miserable. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, let's see here. Um, I just want um, to scan. Just to see if there were any other questions yeah. that people were asking. Did we did we hit them all? Uh, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Connor. Are you guys still trying to acquire that? Was it a tugboat? The historic tugboat? Yeah. 
So uh, the tugboat that uh, John is referring to is a tugboat known as the James Whalen. If you were on Museum Ship's Facebook group, you would have probably seen me posting about it. The Henry is unfortunately our city's, I think, fourth attempt at a museum ship. Uh, oh. The first two never showed up. Like, they never got them. Uh, the Whalen was the first to succeed. And she was an ice-breaking tug built in Toronto uh, that operated in the city of Thunder Bay or in the cities of Port Arthur and Fort William from 1905 until 1965. Uh she was brought back to Thunder Bay in the 90s, but unfortunately, due to negligence uh, on the part of the city of Thunder Bay, uh, just simply due to the fact that I, I wouldn't put a blame on any particular people, just it just really just wasn't a focus for them. She unfortunately ended up springing a leak and she sank in the river she was in. Uh, we had been looking at getting it because the Henry was in part built to replace the Wayland as our harbor's icebreaker. Um, we've been hoping to get it, but with the combination of it sinking and the damage caused by her being raised this September, uh, we're just waiting to see what the city's decision is on the Wayland. We would love to work gotcha. with the city of Thunder Bay in restoring this piece of our community's maritime history. But at this time, uh, we're just having to wait and see. When, when John sent me, John, the, the way this came about, John sent me an email basically saying, hey, there's this guy, Connor, that, and there's an icebreaker, Alexander Henry, you know, Thunder Bay, blah, blah, blah. Um, let's have him on. And like I said, I've always been curious about icebreakers, so I thought this was great. But one thing I don't understand is how did you, Connor, and John cross paths? Museum ships. The Facebook really? group. Yeah, the, the okay. Chips. So that then that leads that leads me to the question. So where where does or how does the Alexander Henry? And I know you you've only been involved. What did you say? Like maybe two years? Uh, uh, realistic, yeah, realistically, I'll be going on three years this year. Three years. Okay. Yeah. So how do you find the Alexander Henry fits into the whole museum ship community? Well, I feel it fits a rather unique role. Uh, like we discussed before, there aren't that many icebreakers in North America as museums. Uh, mm -hmm. There's Mackinac, there's Acacia. I think that's about it. Uh, there's technically Sundu, although she's not, uh, she's not a museum anymore. She's privately owned. Yeah, icebreaker Mackinac, exactly. Um, I think she fills that space, uh, and most notably, she's for Canadian uh, Canadian museum ships. She fills an interesting space because while there are two other Coast Guard museum ships in Canada, Henry is the largest, and I honestly think she fills a very important role that doesn't get enough credit because these guys they aren't they aren't policing like they aren't going after drug smugglers or something like that. These are the guys who go out there every single day, every single week, and do the mandatory work that's needed to keep our maritime economies running, whether it be keeping the buoys functional, whether it be supporting the lighthouses back in the day, whether in these days it's repairing the lighthouses, uh, whether it's just uh, clearing ice so that those last Lakers or freighters can get through. Uh, I think that by Henry being a museum, she represents not just the Canadian Coast Guard, but also the work that both Coast Guards in on the Great Lakes do to keep our economy running. And I think that's an important job that needs to be reminded, uh, people need to rem be reminded about. Well, I can, I can definitely, uh, I can definitely pick on, pick up on the passion that you have, uh, for this ship here. Definitely without a doubt. Um, mm -hmm. you, you got the bug. <laughs> um, I do. I do. What, I will not deny it. What's uh, so? What's next for the Henry coming up in 2023? You started off by talking about how you guys are really kind of. Uh, it, did you use the term rebranding, or you, you're creating a whole new approach? I asked you before we came on. You know, if you guys had a YouTube channel, if you had a Facebook page, and yeah. it sounds like you you're almost creating that so, from this point forward. 
Mm -hmm. So we did have a Facebook page, uh, which was called the Lakehead Transportation Museum Society. Unfortunately, due to problems that I can't bring into right now, we lost access to it. Okay. Um, so it is dead. Uh, at the same time, we've, we've also decided that we will probably be banding our public name to be the Transportation Museum of Thunder Bay. Um, and this is partially due to the fact that when people are coming to the city for tours or to do touristy things, because our city is the linchpin of the Canadian highway system, you can't drive in Canada without coming past our city. <laughs> when you look up Thunder Bay, you don't see the Henry because we're called the Lakehead Transportation Museum Society. This region hasn't been called the Lakehead officially in 50 years. Mm -hmm. It's the Thunder Bay District. So by doing that, we make ourselves more obvious to the public. Uh, by being a transportation museum, we stay truthful to our goal, which is to preserve and remember all aspects of transportation, even though the Henry is our biggest artifact. And um, we are planning on creating a new Facebook page in the near future. If you want to know when that Facebook page goes live, I would recommend following, and I've mentioned it before, the Museum Ship Facebook group because I will post updates there as we get closer to the launch. Uh, we are looking at YouTube as well once we get internet back on site because we're actually going to be getting a bunch of new systems set up there. And, um, yeah, and if you want to reach us directly, uh, our email is info at tmtv.ca. So if you have any questions about whether it be volunteering, uh, donation, just interest in general, just send us an email there and we will get back to you. It was, um, did it, it cut out? No, no, no. I heard you. Oh. I just want to make sure I got this right. It was info at tmtv.ca. Yes. Okay. All right. I, like I said, a few moments ago, I can definitely pick up how, how, passionate you are about this particular ship which i think is cool uh, mm -hmm. but uh, what i also find pretty interesting you know i've got a huge passion for youtube and and getting these museums and museum ships out on you know various social media platforms so i think it's a pretty exciting time mm -hmm. for you guys and i don't know I, I i think the alexander henry is pretty lucky that you decided to take a tour a couple of years ago yeah <laughs> I don't want to sound uh, self-important or anything, but I would agree. Um, if I could address... <laughs> hey, hey, if, if we don't brag about ourselves, who's going to brag about us? So, yeah, if, don't, uh, don't if, go humble on me. If I could address uh, something one of the commenters said, uh, Eric H., he said that uh, United States Navy stipulates that boilers and other machinery... Yeah, thank you. Um, not be, like, cannot be ran. Um the difference is uh, the Canadian Coast Guard, unlike their American counterparts, are a civilian operated group. Uh, so we are actually not a military organization. Our rules are a little different as a result. Hmm. Wait a second. The Canadian Coast Guard is not a military branch? No. I never knew that. Only no. in America. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah. No, we're our, we're our own separate branch of government. Because originally what happened was uh, the Can when the Henry was launched, you'll know she had a black hull. That's because she was actually what was called the Ministry of Transportation's Marine Service. In 1962, so only two years after she entered service, that changed. And they were split. Yeah, that's the picture. Mm -hmm. And Coast Guard covers the sea and Transport Canada covers the land. So that's how it is now. I, okay. Um, I'm still kind of wrapping my head around the fact that the Canadian Coast Guard isn't military. Um, always yeah, thought it, it was. Yeah, like we still, like the Coast Guard still does things like policing, law mm -hmm. enforcement, like a lot of the same things. It's just seen in a different, it's operating in a different way. Gotcha. All mm -hmm. right. Um, well, Connor, I, I'm, I'm glad to have you on, man. It was, uh, it was pretty informative. Yeah. I learned, I learned a lot and, and I'll, I will take you up on the, uh, you know, when you get closer to launching things like YouTube, Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe we'd, we'd like to have you back on and find a way to Absolutely. promote that. Get, uh, I will get people, uh, I'm sorry. 
I, I said I will keep in contact for sure. Oh yeah, please do. So yeah. uh, uh, Connor Kilgore <laughs> with the Alexander Henry icebreaker. You know what? I just love this picture. I know. <laughs> so I want to bring hey, that back up. Yeah, go ahead. Um, real quick, are you able to share the video that I sent in private chat? So it's it's uh, since we're talking about co uh, icebreakers, real quick, um, we got a video of the Coast Guard breaking the ice around the Slater last year. Hold on a second. Oh yeah, let me, let me see. If they're only two. They're only thirty seconds long, two clips, but it's it's pretty cool. So you kind of get an idea what the the Henry would have been doing, um, except on a much larger scale. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, and I want to I want to say thank you to Connor as well. That was you were for being there two years, almost three, as you said. You have gained an impressive wealth of knowledge that I am mm -hmm. uh, very impressed with. Yeah, and your passion, hundred well, percent. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank thank you, Shane. And I will say that both as my job as an admin as at Museum Shifts, but I've been following your work at Buffalo quite closely, and it's just no end of i'm no end of impressed because the work you guys have had to do especially after the incident with sullivan's is just incredible and i hope you guys nothing but the best thank you connor and thank you for following and we'll yeah. keep you updated now we were connected you know yeah. you know and i was trying to uh be prior to covid i was working with the haida uh mm -hmm. and we were going to do some joint videoing and then COVID hit and you said about how stringent the restrictions were in Canada. And, you know, for two years, they wouldn't, they just weren't at work, you know, it, 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 and it, it kind of deadened and killed all of that momentum that we had, yeah. but I'm looking to reach back out and do joint things with them because they're only an hour and a half away from us. So you should also talk with the uh, Ojibwe in Port Burwell. It's, not that much farther away. Okay, it's like maybe an hour farther. Um, she's in Port Burwell, Ontario, right on Lake Erie. Port uh, Burnwell? Burwell. Burwell. I'm going to look yeah. that up. Yeah. John, I'm trying to pull that video up. For some reason, I can't get it. Uh, I can't. Oh, you know what? I could probably share my screen. If you, if you can pull it up, go for it because I'm trying to pull it up through. It's just, for some reason I can't get it to go. Do you see it, Shane? I I, I didn't get the name of the ship because it seems like it's an Aboriginal name or something. So yeah. I just went oh. to the port. O G I O J I B W E. No. Uh, o. Oh, it's Shane's oh, name. Hold on. I'll send it to you in the private chat. Oh, John, John's able to pull it up. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, look at wait. that. So this is an icebreaker running around the Slater? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So basically what the icebreaker is doing here, it's actually going up over the ice, and it's crushing it with its weight. But the uh, oh. did the Henry do the same thing? Yes, it's the exact same thing, only that ship is probably a third of the weight. Yeah. So yeah. I actually wanted to ask that question, but I held off because I wasn't, no, no, I wasn't hundred percent sure that's how it operated. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a few ways ships break ice, but generally it's by creating force on the ice and causing it to buckle under the ship, at least with the way the Great Lakes ones work. So then that yeah. means that the Alexander Henry has some pretty serious horsepower um, engine wise. Power? To, to to force it the weight of the ship and i'm not saying the whole ship obviously mm -hmm. but probably the bow the third the front third yeah. to force it onto the ice there's got to be some serious horsepower behind those engines mm -hmm. well, like i said we have two engines uh i'm getting i'm getting 3550 bhp that's what's saying here anyway and, and like two I said, engines. I'm not the engineer. I'm the tour guide. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, two engines on board, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's mm. that's some pretty serious stuff. <clears throat> yeah. And so, uh, go ahead. Yeah, and like I said, Henry wasn't the most powerful, even amongst her sisters, but she did the job she was designed for. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Um, and I love that sideways launch. Uh, I mean, that is a beautiful. <laughs> I know. I mean, there's nothing like that. You know, yeah, that's a picture, isn't it? You could just see the, the you could just see the buildings across the river or whatever it yeah. is. If you slit her down normal, she goes smack right in. <laughs> so, um, so if you could actually go through the uh, the pictures for a second, there's one picture. It isn't the one where you're in the dry dock, but you know, there's that wider picture of her in the dry dock. You see the whole ship. Uh, yeah, hold on a second here. I think I know which one you're talking about. Yeah. Um. Because I want to just bring this up. Let's see. All right. Okay. So you're, wait, are you talking no, about this one? No, not that one. Uh, I think I sent it to you. That one. There it is. Oh, that, here, hold on. So Let's... that, so that uh, shipyard right there, that's the same place that she launched. Uh, she oh. in her home dry dock in that picture. What year is this? Uh, so I don't know an exact year, but because she does not have the white racing stripe on the side, uh, that would put her <laughs> between that would put her between 1963 and uh, 1975. Okay. And uh, this was probably a little earlier too, because she's got the older radar dish on top. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm guessing late 60s, judging by this picture. But yeah, she was in her home dry dock in this picture. And when we eventually get her to dry dock again, she will probably be going to the exact same place. And you oh, know that's really cool. What uh what 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 is the what is the goal mm -hmm. or what is the purpose of getting her into a dry dock? Um well and we, I, like, I we're not... question because it sounds like this hull is 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 amazing. Yeah. Uh, and and you're not taking on any water. So why so, why why the need to get it in dry dock? So like I said, we're not we're not looking at right in the immediate future, uh, mm -hmm. but it's something we're looking at in the future to do. Something because uh, what in 25 years? They're not 25 years in. In about a decade's time, it'll have been 22, 23 years, and we we don't want to be in a situation where something cracks and we all of a sudden have to raise an emergency fund so we're always keeping it in the back of our mind uh, it's mm -hmm. not a priority yet but it is something our staff does talk about semi-regularly got it preventative maintenance you know yeah okay yeah. i get but it. it's uh it's not at the top of our list yet right now this year getting the rest of the paint done that's the priority mm. Well, and and rebranding the whole museum. I mean, that yeah. that's a big that's a big step in and of itself. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I I can't I can't stress it enough. You know, obviously maintaining the ships that's one thing, but mm -hmm. building a solid museum around them. You know, to keep mm -hmm. to keep them going. That's another. And, yeah. and the, so, the fact that you guys are all volunteers as well. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is. I, I would imagine most people have a, a full-time job or something outside of that, and you're still well, able to maintain the ship that's mm -hmm. well, a lot in, of in us, great condition. Yeah, a lot of us are doing this while still having jobs. So yeah. we just we just divide the work as needed, and uh, hopefully things turn out because it should be good this year. We're hoping now that the fears of COVID have hopefully mostly rescinded. We're hoping to get back to our pre-COVID American visitation because uh, they made about 40% of our visitors in pre-COVID years. And uh, we're hoping to get back up to that. Mm -hmm. so, You're all in uh, the way if, if you uh, ever come to the border. I'm sorry, say that again? You're all invited if you ever come north to the board of the border. <laughs> Well, you're. Hey, I'm probably I'm, 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 I'll be up there soon. I got to go get some Swiss chalet, so I got, I'm going up there soon. I mean, I live five minutes from the Peace Bridge, so yeah, it's. Oh uh, yeah, I live about forty minutes from the border. Um, Shane, John, any other questions uh, for Connor? I don't think no, so. It's um, all right. fabulous. Yeah, I would encourage right. everyone here to go to the museum ship's Facebook page, though. It's yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be blunt. I'm not familiar with you would think I would ah. be, but I'm not. I'm not familiar with the museum ship's Facebook page. And yeah, well, it's actually a group. Um, but it's a group. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a group that 
and I'll just shill for my other passion ship related. Um, it's a Facebook group that's, I think we're seeing at 60, 65,000 people now, but we're dedicated to the, not like essentially the, uh, promotion of museum ships, not just in the United States, but globally, uh, our president or not our president, but our founder isn't American, although he is an American citizen. Um, I think, I think only one of our members or not one of our members, one of our admins is actually American born. So we are an international group, even though the American ships do get a lot of the limelight because there's just so many of you guys. And, um, we, we promote and we try and just raise awareness for the stuff that people like us do. Like we are preserving maritime, naval, and just history in general. And I think that's a really important thing to promote. Well, that's what we do. You would, you would think with a live broadcast like Museum Ship Mafia that we should definitely uh, uh... – be you know cross paths with you guys so and did you say you're a moderator or an admin i'm an admin wow all right okay yeah. well then i'm definitely glad to have met you uh yeah. fantastic well yeah. let's see um uh let's yeah. see and you can find our website at museumships.us oh okay yeah. all right yeah museumships.us and for and, and, and like I said a while ago, I, I think your guys' website, let me let me pull it up real quick um, because I want people to, it, it's, it's, it's pretty solid, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we just rebuilt it. Here it is. Here it is. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty solid website. That's www tmtb.ca and uh where was that i know you gave us the here it is so if you guys have any questions for connor or uh, any need to get in touch it's info at tmtb.ca um so connor thanks for giving us the time tonight uh connor kilgore with the alexander henry icebreaker museum ship Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker on display in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Like I said, www.tmtb.ca. Thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah. Pleasure. Pleasure yeah, thank here. you so much, Connor. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, uh, Connor, I'm going to shut you down, like I always say, because now we're going to talk behind your back. Okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, thanks for giving us the time, and I hope you have a good evening. Yeah, you too, guys. Have a good yeah, night. Very much. Keep up the good work. Bye. Bye. Right. Bye, bye. Uh, and what a, what a, Connor. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was Sorry. gonna say having Connor on was all because of John um, and that connection that that you made. So yeah, thanks for setting that up, John. Yeah, yeah sure, my pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great, and you know that would be nice. This could be our first realm into the international world of uh, <laughs> museum ships, you know, and it's safe, it's close mm -hmm. to home, you know, all that mm -hmm. stuff. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's good. Very impressed with Connor. I, I mean, you know, he's really embraced. Oh, there we go again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, really I just can't, I can't get enough of that picture. I think it's pretty cool. You know, the thing about Connor, like I said a few moments ago, he's he's like the perfect example of, you know, someone being passionate about, you know, this particular ship. You know, you can be passionate about a destroyer, definitely about a battleship, submarine. Um, and like I said, I've always been curious about icebreakers. There's a little bit of mystery surrounding them that I've always been interested in, but you know, not, you know, it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. And that guy definitely has the passion. He's not getting paid. He's a volunteer. And I mean, there's a lot of work ahead of them to, you know, to get things, um, if you want to say rebranded, but, uh, I, I don't know. I thought he was pretty impressive. And I was, I was glad to have him on tonight. Hopefully, oh, yeah. uh, the viewers that were joining us tonight feel the same way. Um, and I'm kind yeah. of flipping through here just to see if there were any questions. Uh, yeah. Eric yeah, says, thanks John. Thank great you. guest. Um, John Dugan, I'm coming to see Slater and the Sullivan's in September when Drac is visiting Drac is visiting. He'll be in, I'm sure he'll be in Albany, right? I'm sure. Oh, for the, there. for the Hinsa conference. Yeah. Okay. He was there in Hawaii. Um, Ken, are you planning on going? Yeah, I, I sure am. 
Oh, I'll skip um, that then. Okay, good. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you still upset that I shut your mic off earlier? No, no, uh, no. I, I was just playing around with the sound the, or the volume of the speaker. That's all. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, well, all right. That was that was another pretty good one. Um, for for upcoming episodes, uh, if any of the viewers have any uh, uh, subjects that you guys would like us to cover, definitely please let us know. Um, I know Shane, uh, behind the scenes, you might, that was, um, who was that? That was, uh, out of Galveston. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> What's that? I recently sent out those emails. I haven't heard from Travis yet, but no, uh, no, no, we, but it was uh, the guy out of Galveston. Um, who was that? Oh, with uh, the Cavallo and the Stewart. Yeah. Why, why can't I find? Oh, um, no, it was Buzz from Cass and Young. I'm sorry, yep. not out of. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, Buzz from the Cass and Young. So he did respond. We're still waiting for Travis from the Texas. Yeah. Who, I reached out to Janet Cobb, the executive director of the USS Alabama, to see if she wanted to designate a staff or herself. Uh, and there's one other place I. What, I, is, I, what is William talking about when he talks about the Antarctic fleet? I assume icebreaker. That's what I would say, just right off the bat. Icebreaker is part of the, but they did do the um, destroyer escorts were part of it. Fifties and sixties, uh, the deep freeze operations, um, Antarctica. Um, um, you mean it's like? Are you talking like you like militaristic UN? Yeah. So they took a bunch of DEs and I'm assuming destroyers and uh, the radar picket ships. Yeah, um, I died not Australia. I what is Australia. what's next? Australia. Why am I going blank? What's down there? New Zealand. New Zealand. New Zealand. Yes. Yeah, they operate out of New Zealand. Yeah. Really? Okay. Yep. I know. I know the Sullivans. I know all three of our ships were in the Arctic, right? Well, that's NATO, really? at, at, at NATO uh, exercises. Okay. Uh, hmm. I can't remember the operation names offhand, but. Uh, hmm. I know all three of them were. They're blue noses, I guess you could say. But we, Antarctic. We, yeah. We have a tour guide. Um, he served on two DEs in the 50s in the Antarctic. Wow. Yeah, he's in his mid-80s. Connor sent sent a note. He's planning on going to the Hinsa conference this year. Sweet. Con yeah. All right, oh, Connor. very cool. <laughs> yeah, I look forward to meeting you. And I don't know if they're members of Hinsa, but they, if they can, they should mm -hmm. become members of Hinsa if they can. Yeah, so Frank was talking yeah, about the yeah. Antarctic fleet. They were radar pickets, uh, part of the radar. I, I, I'm not familiar with that. I'm going to have to research yeah, that one. That might cool. be interesting. One of the things that I uh, I wanted to mention to you guys, um, and, and behind the scenes, I, I know I've, I've kind of pitched the idea of possibly like kind of like doing a book club situation, but you guys have, have a ton of books that you need to read. One of the things I wanted to do an episode on was a, a favorite book of yours that you have read. Mm. That you want? Well, I think to you already know about. mine. Do I? Last what? stand ten can scalers. Uh, I I, I, I kind of thought that would that that would be the yeah. case, but um, there, and 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 you could definitely talk about why that would be your favorite. I mean, I have my reasons too. But do you think that would be an interesting episode? I I would love to hear what you guys hmm. and your favorite book may not may not be tin can. Uh, you know, uh, Horn Fisher's last stand of the Tin Can Sailors. But uh, Shane, what do you think about that? Well, I think it's cool because I'm a book nerd, right? So, <laughs> uh, yeah, a favorite favorite naval book, I assume, correct? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or book um, on on the military branches. Yeah, possibly, and 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 make your pitch as to why it's uh, absolutely. I've got one that stands one. right out, baby. I got yeah, we might have to do out. that. You know, especially since we've got Audible uh, starting to kind of support us a little good. bit. Um, that might be a pretty good one to cover. No problem at all. Um, all right, John Epp, curator, USS Slater, Albany, New York. Uh, before we sign off, anything uh, you want to pitch or let us know what's coming up? No, we're just uh, getting ready for the season. Um, we'll open April April 5th. If anyone does decide to come visit us in the first 
two, three weeks tops of the season. It is going to be a little mess. Uh, actually, our gift shop will be operating <laughs> out of one of those pod storage units in the parking lot. So that's going to be interesting. Um, we uh, Our first uh, speaker event is going to be April. It's the last Saturday of April, uh, 29th, 30th, something like that. Um, so that's something you want, may want to check out as well. Okay. Cool. Um, let's see. Uh, and, and in order to check out the uh, videos that the USS Slater has coming up, their YouTube channel, simply search for USS Slater. It'll come right up. Website, ussslater.org. And for Shane Stevenson, curator of the Buffalo and Erie County Naval Military Park, what's coming up for you guys? Sure. We open March 25th. Uh, we are going to be very... So we're it's celebrating the 80th anniversary. So that's a subject we're not going to cover now. But so we're working with the Cass and Young and the Kid because uh, all of our ships are having in the all of our Fletchers are having the 80th anniversary this year. So we've had some good Zoom conversations and emails, and we are setting a course uh, for the rest of the season, specifically for us with the Sullivans. But then we're also going to be doing some celebrations with the Kid and the Cass and Young. And certainly the Charette slash the Velos, which is in Greece, um, mm -hmm. which is also her 80th as well. Very quickly after we open on March 29th, we have the Vietnam uh, Veterans Memorial Day celebration. So we're uh, honoring Vietnam veterans. And, uh, and then our season just kicks off and looking forward to it. It's going to be an exciting year. We don't have – we're getting the uh, report back from Joe Lombardi – uh, probably within two to three weeks, his final report as the surveyor. And then the, we will chart a course uh, from what his recommendations are uh, for the rest of the season and getting into dry dock. So. What about the uh, members only uh, section that you guys have on your YouTube channel and what's coming up next for that? Uh, yeah, I for the members who become members, we, we're going to do two uh, members only videos. Uh, and then do a one twenty hundred watch with Shane and Steven. Uh, and so that's every month. So starting this uh, with February, we're now on the 8th. I have not filmed it yet, but I'll be getting one out probably next week. Then our live session and then another a video to follow up for the last month of February. So, yeah, we're steady and we're growing a little bit. And uh, it's appreciated for everyone. And I hope people find value from it. And uh, participate. So when, when is when is the next twenty hundred? So the twenty hundred watch is now going to be on the members only section. When when is the next one coming up? Oh, you know he's not here to defend himself. I have no idea with Stephen. Oh, you so know. that's Stephen. Okay, Steve. Okay, yeah, he'll he'll just say, "Hey, how about today?" And I'll be like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> well, I enjoyed yeah. the last one. I thought it was a different way of going about it. And yeah, uh, for those of you that aren't aware, the Buffalo Naval Park has their own members only section. You can find it next to the subscribe button. Simply click join. It'll take you right there. It's four ninety five a month, and uh, that's kind of some behind the. That's a behind the scenes approach to what's going on at Buffalo Naval Park. Um, anything else that you wanted to mention, Shane? No, I think, no, I think we're good. It just, this was a great talk. Connors are, seems to be like a great guy and thank you everyone for being here. Yeah. In order to check out the uh, Buffalo and Erie County Naval and Military Park, their YouTube channel, simply search for Buffalo Naval Park. And of course their website, mm -hmm. Buffalo Naval Park.org. Anything else that you guys wanted to cover? I think that's it. What do you got yeah. coming up? Um, I've actually been creating a bunch of YouTube shorts oh, about some subjects that I'm, that I'm seriously interested in. So yeah, if you guys want to check out history X, um, some YouTube shorts that I've been creating kind of about the U S Navy. I don't know if it, uh, many people are aware, but the U S Navy actually had two flying aircraft carriers. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, and I know that's, uh, John, you're kind of smiling, but they did. Um, they're pretty amazing. They were the USS Macon and the USS Akron. And I've always wanted to do videos about it. So I created a couple of YouTube shorts about that. You can check out History X. Simply search for History X channel on YouTube and go into the short section. They're less than a minute long, and they talk about the, uh, uh, the USS Akron and the Macon. Um, like I said, flying aircraft carriers. And then there's another video about, unfortunately, uh, 
some tragic deaths that occurred trying to get these things to dock. Uh, they were not easy to mm -hmm. dock. And uh, so I created a couple of uh, YouTube shorts about that. Uh, Frank, if you checked them, it sounds like uh, Frank's checked them out. Great. So that's, that's nice. pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I'll be posting some more. So uh, those those are pretty pretty good platform to get some subjects that I'm extremely interested in um, onto, um, onto YouTube. And let's see. William Walker, why not try a short on the USS Michigan battleship to sub? So USS yeah. Michigan was a battleship, and then now it was a submarine, you know, nuclear oh, sub. Oh, oh, I see what he's saying. Okay. Maybe. Um, and for John, he asked a question about the membership real quick. Uh, it's it's four ninety nine. It's four ninety nine a month. So you would pay once a month for it is four ninety nine, four dollars ninety. Yeah, that's actually what's kind of cool about it. you know when when you Maybe join some of these YouTube channels. No, yeah, it's totally monthly. You know, there's no commitment, there's no requirement, uh, and you just you're able to just check out what they have to offer. And some channels you might find it's like yeah, all right, not for me. <laughs> You cool. know, and then, you know, you let them, but at least you, you try it out and you support the channel. I think if you uh, check out what Shane and Steven have uh, going on, um, it's, it's pretty interesting. And, and if for, if for no other reason, it's, it's, you know, it's five bucks a month. It's a great, it's, it's another great way to just throw your support behind what, you know, what's going on in these channels. So definitely check out the Buffalo Naval Parks members only uh, section and, uh, you know, give it a test drive. Thanks, um, guys. Hopefully that answered John's question. Um, let's see, Frank. Yeah, Frank, you've been checking out the shorts. I appreciate the support. Thanks for checking those out. I'll be posting some more. And, uh, you know, if you subscribe to History X, you'll get a notification that, uh, that they're coming up. Um, if there isn't anything else, I just want to remind people that um, Audible, you know, uh, starting to support uh, Museum Ship Mafia. So this uh, episode is partially uh, made possible by Audible Audiobooks. Listen to the good stuff. Check out the link to Audible in the uh, description below for this live broadcast. Click on it. I've got a couple of links to some example books um, like Pappy Boyington's uh, Baba Black Sheep. That's a fantastic audio book to check out if you guys haven't already. So definitely check out Audible. And... With that being said, as I always say, apologies to Ryan Szymanski of the Battleship New Jersey for not being able to get him on this week, but one of these days we'll have Ryan on. <laughs> um, I'm sure he understands. For audio versions of this podcast, search for Museum Ship Mafia on your favorite podcast platform. Um, if there isn't anything else from John and Shane, my name is Ken Stano with the YouTube channel History X. Thanks for watching, everyone, and we're going to shut this down. Everyone have a, have good a great evening. night. Thank you, guys.